Uh, good morning, and <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizing uh, committee for inviting me. Uh, concerning the question, this was not the answer I hoped to. Um, I started my career in working on the immunological microenvironment, but then um, there are other things that, in my mind, are possibly, possibly more important, and this is the metastatic microenvironment. <clears throat> Um, you all know the, I'm sure you all know, the, uh, <clears throat> the scheme of metastases when cells from the primary tumor leave the primary tumor, they invade extracellular matrix, they intervasate into blood or lymph, and they reach a secondary site. Uh, in the secondary site, there are three scenarios. The cells could either die, could either stay as dormant micrometastases, and micrometastases either as single cells or as small clusters of cells, or develop into a macrometastasis. Uh, the question is where do metastases arise and how do they get there? This gentleman, 125 years ago, um, provided an answer that is still valid for many of us. The, his name is uh, Stephen Paget. He published this article in The Lancet in 1889. And in his words, uh, he was very much concerned with site-specific metastases. He wrote, when a plant goes to seed, its seeds are carried in all directions, but they can only live and grow if they fall on congenial soil. If you trans translate this language into today's language, so today's nomenclature, the seed would be the tumor and the soil would be the metastatic microenvironment. Uh, how do cells get to the uh, secondary site? There are probably um, several ways. I just depicted two. One would be what we would call a targeted migration in which uh, cells, uh, tumor cells, express certain receptors or counter receptors for ligands that are present in a certain secondary organ. This could be, as we and many other people have looked at chemokine receptors, uh, the ligand in this case is present in the lungs the a tumor has re receptors for this ligand, and they would then be targeted to the secondary site and produce metastases in this place. The second scenario would be a that uh, is actually the topic of the lecture, which I changed a little bit. Um, would be um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. In this case, the cells would change the phenotype from epithelial to mesenchymal. Mesenchymal cells can uh, migrate uh, much more easily than epithelial cells. And these cells would, um, would migrate into many organs, but would make metastases only in a permissive uh, environment, permissive microenvironment, uh, which in this case is uh, the lungs. Uh, I was asked to talk about epithelial to uh, mesenchymal transition. Now let me give you some uh, description of uh, this phenomenon, which uh, some of us think it is very crucial uh, in the metastatic spread. This is a process by which epithelial cells lose their cell polarity and cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and gain migra uh, migratory and invasive properties. Cells undergoing EMT, uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, are characterized by phenotypic changes such as loss of the epithelial marker E. cadherin and a gain of the mesenchymal marker Vimentin. We'll come back to them a little later. Many of the EMT inducers originate in the tumor microenvironment, and as you could gather, the tumor microenvironment is a basic uh, theme of this lecture. 
initiation of metastasis requires invasion, which is enabled by EMT. Now, this is a schematic representation of EMT occurring in one of uh, the cells in an epithelial uh, monolayer. Uh, in this case, there are signals that are delivered from the microenvironment. Um, um, as, as you can see here, uh, uh, from various cells in the microenvironment, fibroblasts, um, uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and so on and so on. These, either by direct cell-to-cell -cell contact or by soluble factors um, and receptors that are expressed on the cells that undergo um, EMT, uh, deliver signals um, to, the, uh, to the epithelial cell that is going, undergoing EMT. And uh, uh, here is a list, incomplete list, of uh, genes that are involved in, um, in uh, EMT. For instance, you'll see um, uh, later on uh, snail, uh, zeb, uh, slug, twist, and so on. Now, this is very schematically the way that, uh, that cells metastasize using the EMT um, uh, um, route. Uh, some cells in the margin of the primary tumor undergo changes into cells that, that, that are expressed here as partial EMT. These cells then migrate, invade the blood, extravasate, form dormant micrometastases, which later on undergo a progression to form a micrometastasis. Now, uh, there are quite of a lot of, well, uh, not a lot, but some studies on the involvement of, of, of EMT in uh, real carcinoma. For instance, uh, um, SNAIL, which uh, you have seen is a gene that is involved in cells undergoing EMT, uh, is a major regulator of EMT, is predominantly expressed in high-grade um, uh, renal carcinoma and high snail expression is a bad prognostic factor. Um, I'm not going through all these studies. Those who wish to see it, I can show the slide uh, later on um, in the uh, lunch break. Uh, those who want the, uh, sp some sp uh, look at some specific uh, studies. Let me now go back to the, uh, to the secondary site in which, as I told you, cell, the cells that arrived there could either die, could remain as a dormant micrometastases, or progress into macrometastases. We have evidence, other people too, of course, is that the metastatic microenvironment, the, the microenvironment that is, uh, that operates in a certain organ site is responsible for these three things, either for death, for um, dormancy, or for progression. Uh, what, if, what is actually the tumor microenvironment? Uh, you have seen by the question that uh, was posed before that uh, you have seen some two or three different aspects of the microenvironment angiogenesis, immunity, and so on. Uh, inflammation, uh, very important. Uh, EMT, another, another thing. So the, what is the tumor microenvironment? It's composed of resident cells that live in the, in the metastatic organ all the time, such as endothelial cells of fibroblasts. Infiltrating cells and metastases uh, cause the influx of various types of cells into the metastasis, so do primary tumors, by the way. And these are lymphocytes, macrophages, fibroblasts, and so on. Then you have the extracellular matrix with uh, tens or hundreds of different proteins. Uh, some of them are collagen, fibronectin. Uh, 
released molecules, you have there a lot of cytokines, chemokines, antibody, proteases, angiogenic factors, and so on. Um, solid tumors are, um, are characterized by lack of oxygen, oxygen, and if the patient is treated as it is, the drugs obviously should arrive at the microenvironment. All these factors may interact with tumor cells and with non-tumor cells in the tumor microenvironment, and these interactions regulate gene expression in non-tumor cells or in cancer cells. Either, and let me uh, start from the right, as we do in Israel, uh, death, dormancy, or tumor progression. Um, I have one of the main emphasis of this talk is the fact that metastasis is a organ-specific phenomenon. This is very, very important. And let me now just uh, illustrate in a system that we are working on uh, besides others, and this is melanoma. Primary melanoma um, um, it grows um, and migrates to other side to the region, the lymph node, uh, to lungs, uh, liver, and finally to brain. Uh, it should be, I think, borne in mind that because of the different microenvironments in these different organs, and the fact that microenvironmental factors regulate the uh, many characteristics in the tumor cells, including the malignancy phenotype, uh, that the different microenvironments can result in different types of uh, tumors. And I think that clinicians, uh, maybe the next phase of um, clinical um, uh, research should be to ask whether metastasis in a certain organ is a different entity or sub-entity of metastasis in, uh, in another organ. Now, there are several questions that can be asked. What directs tumor cells to different organ sites? If you have different organ sites, obviously different microenvironments. And microenvironment signals differ from organ to organ. This is very simple. Um, do tumor cells in one metastatic site differ from tumor cells in other sites? We and others have evidence that this is the case. In other words, site-specific metastatic signature. What keeps micrometastasis in a state of dormancy? This is one of the questions, a key question that I, I'd like to give you some hints to, and not in renal cell carcinoma, but it may also be true in renal cell carcinoma. And what awakens dormant micrometastasis? Organ-specific survival and growth factor. Both these questions are clinically very important. Because if you have something that restrains the growth of metastases or micrometastases, you can maybe think about a potential drug they, um, that, could be, that could be maybe uh, produced and, and, uh, and administered. And if you know what awakens dormant micrometastases, you may be able to inhibit such awakens. Um, just a few words how uh, our systems, we are working with human to mouse xenograft models in which we generated non-metastatic and metastatic variants that originate from the same human tumors. We are using neuroblastoma and melanoma. In other words, they have an identical genetic background. This means that genetic proteomic and transcriptomic differences between such variants may therefore be attributed to their differential metastatic capacity. Let me now show you some interactions between um, neuroblastoma cells and a certain metastatic site, and this is the lungs. Now, the way we have done it is to inject human neuroblastoma cells into the adrenal gland of mice, where a lot of a human a neuroblastoma starts. Uh, this is called an autotopic inoculation. Uh, we got uh, tumors in the, obviously, in the adrenal and spontaneous metastasis in the lungs. These cells were cultured. They were again put into mice. Um, and what we have seen that these cells from the adrenal 
produce micrometastases in the lung, whereas the macrometastatic cells um, produce, as expected, macrometastatic um, lesions in the uh, in uh, nude mice. Now, micrometastatic cells cannot usually be seen by ordinary methods like uh, like uh, histochemistry or immunohistochemistry. Do I have 20 minutes or 15 minutes? You had 20 minutes on the uh, in the program. Yeah. I think it was only dialed to 15. And um, we started the session a bit late as well. Um, so we uh, can detect these uh, cells by a real-time PCR um, using a probe for a human gene. In other words, mouse, uh, which is not expressed by the mouse. So any human gene in the mouse would mean that we have neuroblastoma cells. Now, as you can see here, here's a signal um, for a macrometastasis, which is very large, and a very small signal for micrometastasis, but is there. So we have, we have a very small number of human and neuroblastoma cells in the lungs that cannot be seen by ordinary histological or immunohistological methods. I talked about micrometastasis, but I think it's important uh, to, uh, be, to be on the same page. Now, micrometastases are called by some people dormant tumor cells, disseminated tumor cells, or micrometastases. Uh, several questions. Are micrometastases the, pro the progenitor cells for metastases? If yes, what keeps them dormant? Do dormant micrometastases wake up? If yes, what wakes them up? Are genomic, epigenomic alteration in the dormant tumor cells involved? Is it the metastatic microenvironment? Is it both? Can the awakening be inhibited? Uh, one very important point is that at least in the neuroblastoma system, and I can say that also in another system that they are working with, and this is brain metastasis in melanoma, the dormant cells are only dormant in the secondary organ site. If you take these cells out, they would proliferate very nicely in vitro. If you put them, again, uh, the neuroblastoma cells into the adrenal, um, the, uh, the human melanoma cells into the skin, they would grow tumors. So in other words, the dormancy is limited to the metastatic site, and this is not a loss of inherent um, uh, ability to proliferate. What keeps micrometastasis dormant in the metastatic site? Well, there was an article of George Klein a few years ago uh, entitled, Why do we not all die of cancer cells at an early age? And his uh, answer to that was that there is a phenomenon that he called microenvironment control or non-immunological surveillance. Uh, in other words, he showed, for instance, that normal fibroblasts at very early stages of tumors could kill in vitro, could kill uh, tumor cells. The fibroblasts lose their ability to kill the same tumor cells in later stages. Our hypothesis was that organ-specific factors restrain the proliferation of micrometastatic cells. And we have proof for that in um, neuroblastoma, for instance, also um, lately starting with, um, with melanoma. We are talking about lung metastases. We take molecules that originate in the lung, um, mix them in vitro with either micrometastatic or macrometastatic neuroblastoma cells. We look at viability. We look at cell, cell cycle kinetics and signal transduction in these target cells. Very briefly, this is the only results I'm going to show you today, is that viability in both types of cells, in the micro and macrometastasis, is reduced, more so in the micrometastasis. That phosphorylation of ERK is reduced in both types of cells, more in the micro than in the macrometastatic cells. Uh, cell cycle arrest is higher in uh, micrometastatic cells than in macrometastatic cells, and apoptosis in both types of cells is, is the same. We have now, we are now in the final stages to purify the inhibitor factor and to identify what it is. What's the significance? And I 
think it goes beyond neuroblastoma. We know it is also occurring in melanoma, probably in other tumors. That endogenous mitometastasis restraining a bioactive factors could regulate tumor progression, um, may overcome drug resistance, we have some evidence for that, and serve as an anti-tumor agent. What's the emphasis here? The emphasis is that the tumor microenvironment, and I'd like to end with that, has actually is a double-edged sword. In, under certain circumstances, uh, it can stop and restrain the proliferation of micrometastases. In other instances, it uh, provides support for the proliferation of macrometastases. Uh, some people show the institute. I show my group. Um, I have, I'm endowed with a great group of young ladies, one, per, one male, um, and the names are here, and these are our collaborators, and I do thank you very much.